there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. The scientific discoveries and technological breakthroughs of the ancient world have shaped our lives in so many ways. Knowledge is always helping people to understand and to take decisions, also to develop a technology based on science, which can improve their daily life. In this episode, we'll trace those footprints from prehistory to the present day. From the invention of the wheel to new land speed records. From backfield surgery on Roman gladiators to the technological strides made in a world war. One of the most obvious footprints of the ancient world is the use of the wheel. The passage from the hunters and gatherers to the farmers can be considered to be the most important revolution of uh, historical times. The first thing that is coming to my mind is the calendar. Of course, it's on every, on every mobile phone and we use it, and now it's sort of the whole world is using one calendar because of now the planet is so interconnected. Since the very dawn of mankind, even before recorded history, science and technological progress help mold the world around us. Ancient Mesopotamia. This part of the world has often been referred to as the cradle of civilization. It's that part of the world where so many different interesting elements and techniques and innovations were actually introduced. Speaking of Mesopotamia, of course, uh, the uh, single most important uh, uh, innovation was uh, urban civilization. So the city was uh, basically born uh, there. And it was here that one of the most important technological developments since fire was thought to have originated. The wheel. It's believed the wheel was invented and developed in Mesopotamia around 3500 BC and has been with us ever since in many forms. The first wheels were potter's wheels, carved out of wood. Later, some bright sparks figured out how to use them for chariots, with four wheels and two axles. From the historical point of view, the wheel develops between 3000 and 2000 before common era, in different locations. So you have different cultures, perhaps, that aren't using this, what then must have been 
incredibly new technology. They see it, it's very simple in its design, and so it pretty much spreads rather rapidly throughout the ancient world. Famously, the ancient Egyptians, they're used to chariots in battle, having archers moving at very rapid speeds, and these chariots mounted, again, on wheels. Buckle up and hold on to your hats. This is the Hennessy Venom GT. Even its name sounds powerful. It holds the current land speed record, accelerating from zero to nearly 300 kilometers per hour in under 15 seconds. It can cruise along at 435 kilometers per hour. The Venom GT has other high-performance cars like the Bugatti Chiron nipping at its wheel. Of course, cars like these are powered by an internal combustion engine. But that engine would go nowhere fast were it not for that one particular early invention. This is the atomic clock. It's capable of measuring time within a quadrillionth of a second, powered by strontium atoms, Experts are confident this timekeeper will neither lose nor gain a second for the lifetime of the universe. Time is a, a really a footprint of civilization. Time was uh, uh, basically discovered or created as a concept uh, by the uh, Babylonians, by the Sumerians. Of course, what ancient civilization had was looking at the sky, looking at what was happening in nature around them. And they could see that there was a season cycle, for example, that the sun was going in a latitude which were not the equator up and down during the year at different elevations with respect to the horizon. This kind of observations. And the key word out of this was periodicity. The Babylonians were perhaps the first people to accurately measure time. They divided the year into 12 months with 30 days in each, divided hours into 60 minutes, and then minutes into 60 seconds. Both the Mesopotamian civilizations and also the Egyptians introduced the sundial, uh, or the obelisk in the case of the Egyptians, in order to measure uh, the passing of time, uh, the movement of uh, light, uh, which would indicate uh, the shift from uh, one period of time to the following. Okay. The Babylonian's degree of accuracy was not quite a quadrillionth of a second, but given their Bronze Age technology, it was still pretty remarkable. It's a system that has served us well for centuries. Then from those uh, Mesopotamian civilizations, uh, these concepts passed on to uh, the Greeks, and then from the Greeks to the Romans, and so on. In the ancient world, everyone knew that there were certain months, usually at least four months of the year, when you did not sail in the Mediterranean. You did not attempt to navigate the waters because they're very rough during the winter, and therefore risk not only loss of life to yourself and your crew, but perhaps even more importantly, depending on your perspective, the product that you're trying to gain capital upon. Practically all later civilizations learned from the Babylonians to look to the skies for a deeper understanding of the world around them. kept on looking at data and finding periodicities. And then what happens is on the basis of this data, then we have a model. For example, then we now know that the moon is going around the Earth, and then we can interpret this cycle in terms of the movement of the moon. The Babylonians were also the first mathematicians of note. Babylonian mathematics included a rudimentary understanding of fractions, algebra, quadratic and cubic equations, and even trigonometry.
This is the Plimpton 322. It's a 3,700-year-old tablet which is stored at Columbia University. It suggests that the Babylonians were studying trigonometry, the lengths and angles of triangles, well before the ancient Greeks. It is probably the earliest trigonometric table. So this actually would highlight uh, of the role of the Sumerians from the point of view of developing an approach, an interest towards higher level of mathematics. According to some math historians, the Babylonians may have even calculated the Pythagorean theorem a thousand years before Pythagoras. The square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Who can forget that from high school? It's a formula that is still in use every day. Most people, when they think of geometry, they cannot but think of the Greeks, Pythagoras, Euclid, etc. The interest on the part of the ancients, and specifically the ancient Greeks, begins with very practical intentions, reasons, purposes. If you want to design something which an engineer can actually build and make stable, you need geometry. Sadly, we are no longer able to admire the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. They were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, a marvel of Babylonian building. But what is left of Babylon looks geometrically correct. We can also see from the Babylonian pyramids so-called ziggurats, that they understood that the triangle was the strongest form in geometry. It was also pretty much used for engineering purposes or reasons. Uh, if you need to build structures such as pyramids or the ziggurat in Mesopotamia, for example, so temples or other huge buildings, you probably need uh, to calculate precisely how these structures should be constructed. This computer graphic, a theoretical reconstruction of the Tower of Babylon, clearly illustrates the importance of geometry in building. The beginnings of geometry left an unmistakable footprint of civilization. Standing atop the ziggurats and looking up at the night sky was the beginning of another scientific discipline. Nearly 5,000 years ago, Babylonian stargazers became the first astronomers. Of course, astronomers did use mathematics and they still do it. Especially, I would say, geometry and trigonometry was uh, much needed. Why? Because uh, astronomy has to deal with movements in the sky. So, you know, mathematics and physics are always somehow catching up each other. Sometimes mathematics is going farther than what physics is able to, to, to catch it up, and sometimes the opposite. The physicist discovers something that needs a mathematical modeling to be fully understood and modeled. The Hubble Space Telescope has greatly expanded our knowledge of the universe. Launched in orbit around the Earth in 1990, it's the most powerful telescope ever built. It's about the size of a school bus, but unlike any school bus, it can span the distance between London and Los Angeles in under 20 minutes. It's almost as much a time machine as it is a telescope. Why? Because a distant galaxy appears through its lens as it did when the light left it, which might be millions of years ago. And it's all a long way from the ancient Babylonians. 
standing on tiptoes atop their ziggurats. They had a similar purpose, to figure out our place in the universe. They didn't really have the instruments that we can rely on today, of course, but they did have some uh, instruments, some uh, sort of technology that they could uh, employ for their observations. The armillary uh, sphere, for example, all those instruments were employed uh, not really to inquire into the nature of the celestial bodies, but rather to measure their movement. Now we have astronomy, but astronomy is fascinating, and, and especially technology is, is, is able to fascinate people as much as they're looking at the stars uh, in former times. Because what do we have? We discovered the, we have now uh, the base exploration. Uh, we have orbiting observatories around the Earth. They sent us incredible images of the universe, of what's happening in the universe, of the Milky Way, what are the surfaces of the planet. By around 2000 BC, or 4000 years ago, the Babylonians were recording lunar eclipses. By 700 BC, they could predict lunar eclipses based on their record keeping. Prediction is another characteristic of science. How you can predict, and for example, predicting that winter will come again, this on the basis of observations. Predicting an eclipse, this was a big issue in, in former times. At that time, science and religious belief were a little mixed up, so people were afraid if the moon was uh, suddenly becoming uh, dark or the sun was disappearing. Uh, there was a lot of fear, and so the governments had to know it before. In order for civilization to develop, a revolution had to take place that should never be taken for granted. Mankind shifted from being hunter-gatherers to farmers. passage from the hunters and gatherers to the farmers happened roughly 10,000 years ago in the time of the Stone Age occurring between the Paleolithic and the Neolithic. So this is the period of time in which you have this shift from those who uh, relied on uh, hunting and gathering what could find basically to those who decided to settle within a specific portion of land or territory, grow their uh, crops or domesticate their cattle or other animals. As sure as the sun rose in the morning and set in the evening, the ancient Egyptians needed food and water. Then, as now, most of Egypt was a desert. However, every year the Nile would flood, spilling over with water that flowed down from the mountains to the south. But when the water receded, it left behind rich soil in which the ancient Egyptians grew their crops. To irrigate their crops, the Egyptians created a canal system. They built gates to these canals so they could control the flow of water, and they built reservoirs to store water in case of drought. Whatever the drawbacks of early agriculture, the majority of ancient Egyptians could now feed themselves. Once a society is able to do that, it can flourish and develop in all sorts of unforeseen ways. Of course, uh, uh, the society of farmers uh, is much more uh, specialized uh, than the society uh, of the hunters and gatherers. So there is a specialization, a specialization of the different roles that they have uh, within this uh, society. Also settlement is one of the advantage of this. While you settle, you can live a kind of stable life. You can have control of a, a specific uh, portion of territory. The ancient Egyptians were also obsessed with the night sky. They could identify five of the planets in our solar system. 
They also observed that the rising of Sirius, the dog star with the sun, would precede the annual flooding of the River Nile. Some Egyptologists even believe the Sphinx, the Giza Pyramid Complex, and the River Nile were a mirror image of the constellations of Leo, Orion's Belt, and the Milky Way. There are many reasons for doing this. Religious as an observatory, because then you, you use the buildings as an observatory for measuring, for example, time and, and the transit of stars, uh, or uh, just because it's beautiful. Research suggests the Egyptians were able to align structures to true north within one tenth of a degree, as is the case with Khufu's pyramid. But how were the Egyptians able to line up the pyramids at Giza with the three stars in Orion's belt? We may never know. It's nice to think that every, I don't know how many years, a given star, for example, Aldebaran, is peering through the hole directly to the grave of a great king. It has a power for the imagination. There's nothing, it's just geometry. But if you want to see the beauty out of it and the power of building up the whole celestial mechanics that is doing this, to govern celestial mechanics so certain things are happening, uh, this is the beauty out of it. It's arguably another ancient Egyptian footprint of civilization that we still align buildings with the sun, although this is for practical reasons such as heat and light rather than religious belief. But Egyptian contributions to science and technology originate in some mysterious ways. Strange as it may seem, it was the Egyptian process of mummification that led to some early breakthroughs in medical science. Mummification involved the removal of organs and stuffing the dried body with rags, plants, and spices so it would keep its shape. As they went about their grisly trade, these early Egyptian taxidermists learned much about the workings of the human body. The first heart transplants were performed around 50 years ago, a mere blink of an eye in terms of world history. It was quite a journey from removing organs to being able to perform organ transplants. But that journey began in ancient Egypt and with mummification. Thanks to mummification, Egyptians came to understand much about the human body. They practiced basic surgery, could fix broken bones and dislocated joints, and even stitch wounds effectively. Newfound knowledge mixed with deeply held beliefs. The Egyptians believed they were preparing the corpse of the king for eternal life. Medicine was mixed with alchemy and the quest for immortality. As, as a technique, it belongs to a vast species, though, of material transformations, which are not medieval in origin or, or, or Egyptian, um, but being practiced throughout the Middle East uh, in the Bronze Age and earlier. And what, what's happening is attempts to, to transform materials, uh, to, to alter their properties, um, or to make uh, syntheses of things that exist in nature. If we consider Egypt, they uh, did know how to uh, deal with uh, minerals. Uh, from this point of view, we can find some kind of connections between the alchemical aim of finding, of transforming uh, into a higher standard and uh, the way in which they actually used these uh, minerals. For example, pottery. Even the idea of taking clay from the ground, this wet and malleable substance, and then firing it in a kiln begins to give clay the properties of stone because it's harder. Admittedly, it's brittle, but it's harder. When you then have the invention of glazes that are given to, to pottery, then this is not only like a stone, but it's like a stone that can take a very high polish. Now, no alchemist ever found a way to prolong life or transform lead into gold. 
but their experiments led them to some interesting conclusions. What sustained it in classical antiquity and right into the early modern period was also the Aristotelian world system where everything was composed basically of four elements, earth, air, fire, water. It was believed that basically anything could be transformed with the right processes from one state to another. But there was this idea of an essentially um, infinite uh, intercommutability between elements. And of course, all these ideas were lost in modernity with the advent of the periodic table um, towards the end of the 19th century and a completely different elemental view of the world. Perhaps it's because we are the only earthly species aware of our own mortality. But eternal life, or at least a greatly prolonged existence, is something humans still dream of. Some scientists believe that the first human to reach 1,000 years of age has already been born. All thanks to the thousands of years of alchemical, chemical, and medicinal findings. Ancient Egypt was the birthplace of the medical profession. In those days, people would come from faraway lands to be treated by Egyptian physicians. But across the Mediterranean, another civilization was getting ready to take the baton of progress. When we think of uh, Greek philosophy, we tend to think of these uh, philosophers, maybe in their gardens, walking and thinking about uh, pretty much theoretical uh, things. But we need to know that philosophy uh, also means science. So also means uh, uh, something concrete. For example, knowing that the Earth is round and is not flat, uh, discovering what is the size of the orbits of the planets, that is the size of the solar system, the size of the sun. The big um, discoveries from the point of view of, of physics are those, are changes of perspective, op opening minds to a new way of looking at the world and, and all the consequences. Broken down into two Greek words, and intimate love of something. Philia, of what? Sophia, wisdom. An overarching, ultimate wisdom. The Greeks also continued the good work of medical science. One should not forget that many people at that time believed diseases were the God's way of punishing sinful humans. But those ideas began to change in ancient Greece, mostly due to the work of one man a man whose name we still remember. It was around 450 BC when a certain Hippocrates of Kos began conducting experiments to prove the symptoms of disease were caused by the body's natural reaction to diet, environmental factors, and so on certainly not by vengeful gods. Hippocrates has been called the father of Western medicine. The Hippocratic Oath, which bears his name, was the first known attempt to set an ethical standard among medical practitioners. The Oath of Hippocrates is the single most important document in the history of medicine, establishing the medical tradition in the West. So establishing medicine as a sort of tradition, as a scientific and ethical tradition uh, in Western culture. Hippocrates lived to be 90, a very old age for that time, and his words certainly live on. I will use treatment to help the sick according to my ability and judgment, but never with a view to injury and wrongdoing. Neither will I administer a poison to anybody when asked to do so, nor will I suggest such a course. In the 1960s, uh, this was still something uh, pretty much uh, uh, used uh, in Western universities, for example, in the big British universities such as Oxford and Cambridge.
what is sometimes called the golden rule doesn't change, but our understanding of the world does. What is the universe made of? How did it begin? Physicists today are still seeking answers using particle accelerators, such as the Large Hadron Collider, well named because it's the largest machine in the world. A 20 mile plus ring shaped tunnel made mainly of superconducting magnets some 100 meters underground. Scientists hope this particle accelerator will answer the big questions. Yet around 2400 years ago in ancient Greece, one man working on his own and without even a small Hadron Collider came up with some remarkable insights. This one had the promising name of Democritus, who declared that all matter was comprised of atoms, and his footprint is hard to overlook. These atoms were, he said, physically but not geometrically indivisible. He also believed that between atoms there lay empty space. Furthermore, atoms are indestructible and perpetually in motion. But there were many such eureka moments in ancient Greece, including another one we all learned about in school, when a philosopher named Archimedes, stepping into his bath, cried, Eureka! Eureka! Or, I found it! I found it! In his tub, Archimedes had, in a flash, understood that the volume of water he had displaced getting in the bath must be equal to the volume of the part of his body he had submerged. In essence, the law of hydrostatics. Archimedes and what he had uh, and all the studies about the leverage and the way in which you can actually compute the force that is keeping your ship up. I always thought as a kid, how can an iron ship survive to still be uh, is why it's not drawn. Now we take it for granted, but it, it sort of study also this one coming out of science. It's an application of science and of scientific thinking. Archimedes wrote admiringly of Aristarchus, a Greek astronomer who had lived before him. Aristarchus of Samos uh, is claimed to be the first one of the first to advance the uh, idea that the art and uh, the other planets uh, were actually rotating around uh, the sun. So we know how this idea then was abandoned uh, after a few, uh, a few centuries. The heliocentric system uh, was controversial, became controversial. Uh, in the 16th and 17th century of Copernicus and Galileo for several reasons. One was that it wasn't included in the model of the universe that had been handed down um, since Plato, actually, even slightly earlier, with the Earth at its centre, which had been then canonised, had been sort of enshrined um, in the Aristotelian view of the universe, which was the common belief of uh, how the universe functioned with the Earth at its centre and the Sun uh, moving around it like the other heavenly bodies. So it was difficult to shake off that tradition. So much for the universe, but what about coming back down to Earth and finding ourselves? The Global Positioning System, or GPS, is a mainstay for motor vehicles and modern smartphones. And where would the motorist or traveler of today be without these navigation systems? Completely and utterly lost, probably. It's important to think that each subsequent civilization is standing on the shoulders, as they say, of a previous civilization. So that's certainly true of the ancient Greeks regarding navigation. In terms of going distances beyond the ancient Greek world, so basically the Eastern Mediterranean venturing into Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, or even beyond um, into Persia, perhaps beginning with maybe Alexander the Great, 4th century BC, and his interaction with the famous astronomers slash astrologers from Mesopotamia, the ancient Near and Middle East. You're looking at an early global navigation system 
it is, of course, a map. At over 2,200 years old, it's one of the first known maps of the world, or more accurately, the known world. According to the Greeks, it was the work of one Eratosthenes, a cultured man who ran the Library of Alexandria. One of his most impressive feats was to calculate the circumference of the Earth. Then it turned out something like 40,000 kilometers, which is extremely close to what actually is the measured uh, circumference of the Earth. So he uh, went pretty close to the truth uh, just by uh, considering the movement of shadows, the movement of light and of the sun uh, around the earth. So basically by employing the uh, sundial. He knew that uh, at a certain date of the year that the sun was going, the sun rays were going straight to the bottom of a, of a well. And he knew that in another place, at the same time, this was not happening. So one of the possibility was that the Earth was not actually flat, it was round. This was explaining this difference. Let's then get this funny idea of uh, that the world is round, is not flat. Can we measure how, how big it is? And this is the next major step of science, measuring the universe, cosmology. The natural philosophers of ancient Greece were so far ahead of their time, it's hard to believe. If the Greeks were philosophers, the Romans were eminently practical people. More than the Greeks, certainly the Romans did this. And once you've mapped the territory, you know where point X is in relation to point Z. The Romans famously are going to build a road so that they have a connection to that point, which then frees them from having to constantly rely on navigating by virtue of the heavens or even by virtue of maps. Telling the truth, they were not always uh, innovators, but they were really clever in uh, discovering, re-employing, reusing the other's discoveries. So they managed to use uh, the techniques uh, invented or discovered by the Greeks and they bent these uh, techniques uh, for their practical, military and social political purposes. With a quite justifiable reputation as the fastest highway in the world, the German Autobahn is a motorway designed just for cars. Anything that can't go faster than 80 kilometers per hour is not permitted on the Autobahn, which pretty much rules out bicycles and pedestrians. There's no upper speed limit on much of the motorway, and it is illegal to stop unnecessarily. That includes running out of fuel. The only fuel on the roads in ancient times was stamina. But with horses and carts the only traffic, why did the Romans build such sturdy roads? Well, Rome did not become an empire without being able to mobilize its armies. Communication due primarily to Roman roads, the system of Roman roads that the ancient Romans built all throughout their former empire. Uh, that was the primary vehicle for allowing other vehicles of travelers, uh, oftentimes runners, couriers, if you will. That's where the famous Pony Express probably, probably began. In the 3rd century BC, the Via Appia, a famous Roman road, was constructed connecting the capital with the port town of Brindisi. Now it's a free tourist attraction, although the first nearly five kilometers of the Via Appia, or Appian Way, are still traversed every day by cars, buses, and coaches.
Not only that, but parts of Britain's A1 motorway are based on the old Roman routes. So when it comes to transport, in a very real sense, all roads do lead to Rome. They well and truly left the footprints of their civilization. And with their aqueducts, drains, and baths, it's clear that Romans understood the importance of sanitation, placing them way ahead of some later civilizations. So the Romans would inherit from the Greeks this attention to or for the body. Water was very important for the Romans. We know they constructed so many different aqueducts. Well, the, uh, the Roman aqueduct is certainly probably one of their stereotypically most famous achievements, science and technology-wise. They were among the first, the earliest civilization to connect the hygienic purposes, hygiene, and social status and social environment and background. So it came to be understood, bathing wasn't just a luxury, but a necessity. All of the aqueducts feeding, for example, the city of Rome, begin 60 miles outside the city in the central part of the peninsula in the Apennine Mountains, inside the mountains from natural springs of water. And the problem becomes for the Roman engineer is what happens when suddenly my tunnel comes out the side of a mountain cliff and I'm facing a rather large valley in front of me before I get to the next mountain. And so to maintain that certain gradation for the flow of water, the ancient Romans built what we think of as these aqueducts in order to cover these vast expanses of land until we at least get to the next mountain where we go back inside or ultimately until we get into the city. The Romans themselves discovered and understood that every certain number of feet within the length of an aqueduct, right? Your gradation had to drop by a very precise amount. How exactly the ancient Romans were able to figure that out remains still somewhat of a mystery. The ruins of the Baths of Catacalla outside Rome. In their heyday, with high vaulted ceilings, separate hot and cold baths, they must have been magnificent. The aqueduct which served the Baths of Caracalla was in use until the 19th century. The Romans also advanced the practice of medicine by publishing treatises that could be read, well, by anyone who could read. Ordinary citizens also had greater access to professional doctors. Medicines were manufactured, including pills using plants and herbs. Next time you take a pill for a headache, heartburn, or anything really, remember the Romans. The Romans also developed specialized instruments for surgery, ranging from forceps to wound retractors specific kinds of surgery techniques and instruments, uh, especially those uh, dealing with fractures and similar, were also due to their uh, activism within the military field. This is also the reason uh, why they managed to develop uh, these uh, specific substances, uh, like morphine or uh, what we would call nowadays uh, scopolamine, that could actually quench the pain of uh, the sick, so they could uh, basically uh, translate. interest in war seem to have survived until modern times, and with it, giant leaps in technological progress. Consider technological advances made during World War II, the first jet planes, radar and atomic power. The Enigma machine, a German code device that anticipated computer technology. 
the German V-2 rockets that were the first man-made objects to ever travel into space. So from the point of view of war, of course the Romans uh, developed or reused many instruments, especially as far as uh, siege warfare uh, is concerned. So they invented or uh, just re-employed all the uh, instruments that were already employed by other civilizations, by the Greeks, uh, for example, the, the ballista, uh, the catapult, uh, the siege tower. So all those instruments whose function uh, was that of uh, rendering or making the life of Roman soldiers uh, a little easier. But it also somehow would be the precursor of what we have really in contemporary civilization, another ancient footprint, creating a greater and greater distance between two enemy forces. It almost numbs one to the impact that such bloodshed, devastation, death, maiming has on the human psyche. So much so to this day that now we have drones someone sitting thousands of miles away from the target can rather disinterestedly neutralize, as we like to say, that target. What we really mean is kill, destroy. In war and peacetime, the technological and engineering feats of the Romans just kept coming. But even the glory of this civilization couldn't save it from a fall. A fall that meant a giant leap backwards for science and technology. So what happened to all that ancient ingenuity and know-how? For centuries after the fall of Rome, Western Europe was plunged into the Dark Ages. Agriculture returned to the subsistence farming of the Neolithic era. Literacy receded and was even scorned. Medicine was substituted with blind faith and superstition. But in the Middle East, there was a glimmer of hope. In libraries and places of learning, such as the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, the wisdom of the ancient world was preserved. Footprints of civilizations are interesting and relevant and important uh, because they say something specific. They say what, as humans, we all share, we have in common, and at the same time, they highlight what, as individuals, we develop uh, in a specific way. With the 14th century, came the Renaissance and a great surge of interest in classical teaching in Europe. Somehow, by the skin of our teeth, humanity had scraped by. Tracing the footprints of civilization saved us once, and if we know how to learn from our mistakes, may even help us again. There are many famous sayings about history and about its value. One of the several that I like is to remember not only to learn from errors of the past, to improve positive progress for humanity, but to remember also that we're always standing on the shoulders of giants who have come before us. Scientists, philosophers, innovators, those who are immersed and imbued with the process of critical thinking.